and privilege it is to be here. As uh, Pastor Jessica had mentioned this weekend, um, she had mentioned that I am Mexican. Now, I don't know if you mo know what Mexican is, but it is Mexican and Puerto Rican. And it doesn't mean a whole lot other than I love like 10 pounds of makeup. I love to throw parties. I'm expressive when I communicate. But I do think it bears weight in how I teach the Bible. So there's a lot of new faces in here from the weekend as well as a lot of men. So bear with me. Uh, I want to explain how I interpret the Bible. Now, I was raised uh, going to my Puerto Rican grandmother's house. And uh, she would serve me coffee at the age of six because that's what Latinos do. And I would have a cup of coffee and we would sit there on her couch that was covered with plastic and your legs would sweat underneath it and squeeze around. And we would watch her shows. You know what shows are? Her shows were her soap operas. See, but when I say soap operas, I'm looking at the melanin in, this, in the room right now. I'm realizing when I say soap operas, you're probably thinking, Young of the Restless, Days of Our Lives, One Life to Live, General Hospital if you're old school, Luke and Laura, yeah. But when I say soap operas, I'm talking about novelas, okay? And you might think that Spanish soap operas and American soap operas are the same, but they're not, okay? In American soap operas, there is a sane, neatly dressed, blonde woman with a svelte waist, thighs that definitely don't touch, when she discovers that her forlorn lover has just cheated on her, she will look very sanely at him and say, but John, I love you. Please don't leave. And then in a novella, a woman coming in with a very tight dress, 10 pounds of makeup, eyelashes so long that when she blinks, you feel it through the screen. She comes in like a bat out of hell screaming, pero Juanito, no se va mi amor, por qué? Por qué? Ay, Dios mío, ay, Dios mío, por qué? No se va mi amor. Then someone runs in, runs in, shoots Juanito. You find out that Juanito is her secret baby daddy, and you're like, oh my gosh. That's how I read the Bible, okay? <laughs> So the Bible isn't boring, you might be boring, all right? Today, I wanna to open up the word of God and I wanna let us know with this truth that we are marked with power and authority. So I don't want us to sing songs that the power of God in the name of Jesus can break every chain. I don't want us to sing about it. I don't want us to say it. I don't want us to think about it. I want us to believe it. That God Almighty has sent his son Jesus and in him and in his words and in the sacrifice, his life, his death, his burial and his resurrection, we get to have that same resurrection power. Paul says this in Romans chapter 10. He said the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave, guess what, honey, it's in you. You. you don't have to walk dead to your sins, dead to your trespasses, because you are alive in Christ. And my, my, my gut conviction, my core conviction in bringing this word today is to remind you that you are marked with purpose. You are marked with power. And you are marked with God-given authority. Somebody please say marked. marked. The title of today's message for the note takers. I just want to say front row. You guys are amazing. Yes, Angie. Those are the Bible scholars. Look at their notebooks and their Bibles. I'm old school, give me a paper Bible any day, all right? If you're the note-taking type, the title of today's word is Marked for Power. Marked for Power. Now, you might be familiar with the name Mark because it is a very common name, especially in America. It's one of the most common names in America, actually. But are we familiar with the meaning of the word? Now, we have idioms and colloquiums or even just English statements like X marks the spot on your mark, make your mark, you missed your mark, mark it down, mark it off, mark someone down, mark someone up, or my favorite, they're a marked man, they're a marked woman. When used in this context, they are a marked man, they are a marked woman, it is this, it means that a person who has been singled out because they have witnessed or participated in something that has aroused disruption of perceived order. I was homeschooled, so I'm gonna say that twice. Now, it is somebody who is singled out because they have witnessed or participated in something that has aroused disruption in perceived order. I, about five years ago, embarked on a crazy journey. I felt like God was calling me to go into minister to the incarcerated, prisons and jails. 
And that feeling came after uh, attending a women's conference much like this. I remember being at a women's conference in Missouri, and I had seen God move, and it was so beautiful, and it was all the things that women events are, you know, like unicorns and fairies and glitter and, you know, all the things, cupcakes. And I remember thinking, why aren't we doing this for the incarcerated? And then I felt like the Spirit of God told me, why aren't you doing it for the incarcerated? So I had this crazy idea, this crazy journey. I looked to my husband and I said, I know we have no team, no money, no budget, but I feel like I need to go to prison. And my husband, Matt, was just like, okay, which prison? I was like, I don't know. Um, a, an officer from a detention center in Lubbock, Texas, uh, connected me with a chaplain, and a chaplain was like, I heard this girl, Bianca, at a, at, a, at a conference, and I think that it would be amazing if she came here, but we can't afford it. Honey, all I needed was a credit card and an open door, and Jesus paid it all, all right? So guess what? I hosted not one, not two, not three, but four conferences in a prison in Texas to God be the glory. Now, in one of our gatherings, I met this one girl. Her name was Lasheria. Lasheria had a sister, and Lasheria and her sister, they are tall, all right? Like, I'm 5'3 on a good day, you know? They were tall. They had to be, I don't know, 8'4 or something, what it felt like. They were like six foot, six two. And right during worship, the spirit of God was moving much like it was when we were worshiping together. And big Lasheria, I didn't know her name was Lasheria, big Lasheria came to me and she said, pastor, can I sing? First of all, I don't know if she can sing and that could really ruin a vibe, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I'm also terrified because what was Lasheria in there for? What murder, you know? I was like, sure, you could sing. <laughs> so Lasheria and her sister come forward and they begin to sing. One begins to rap, the other begins to sing. And Lasheria and her sister begin to drop some beats, and I was shook. You can even see my face, like, oh my gosh. We got to this part of the song, and it was the hook. It slapped, it was a bop. She said, it's just me and Jesus, ticket, ticket. It's just me and Jesus. And I remember listening to this hook, and I was like, that's right, girl. Here is this girl who's incarcerated with no end time of when she's gonna be released. And she has lost everything, friend, family, and foe. And she had the revelation, it doesn't matter where I am, it doesn't matter where I've done. I am marked for purpose, I am marked with calling, I'm marked with identity, and it's just me and Jesus. Now, if Lasheria, an incarcerated woman, knew that, the enemy knows that as well. And I believe that many of us have given the enemy way too much room, way too much authority, and way too much power to make us think that that's not for me. The time has passed. My story is done. I am too young. I'm too old. I'm too broke. I'm too uneducated. I'm too short. I'm too tall. I'm too skinny. I'm too floofy. I'm too, I'm too much and yet not enough. Well, if you want to live your basic believing, beige wearing, banana eating belief that you are fine with your two week vacation doing your moral obligation of voting for a president and eating microwave dinners, live your life. But I'm not speaking to those people. I'm speaking to the people who know that there's a seed inside of them that they believe that our God isn't done. That there is something inside of them that is waiting to be released, that is waiting to be called out. And all I've come here to tell you is that you have the authority that God has given you. You have the power of Jesus. I don't know what the Lord has called you to. I'm not promising you a, a thigh gap and a mansion and a Ferrari. I'm not promising any of that stuff. What I am promising you is that when you step into the calling, the passion, the purpose, and potential that God has placed upon your life, there will be a fulfillment that money cannot buy. When you invite God to step into your divine calling, there's a divine invitation matched with the divine calling. It will affect and impact your marriages. It will affect and impact your businesses. It will affect and impact your children. It will affect and impact your college campuses, your communities, and your cubicles. In your singleness, in your marriedness, in your dreams, in your waking, I have come to tell you this. When you know who Jesus is, it changes who you are. When you know who Jesus is, it changes who you are. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, that's what we're going to camp out here today. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Somebody say teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. Somebody say authority. Now, I am from East L.A., California, and graffiti is everywhere, all right? So I believe in biblical graffiti. If you brought your Bible, I want you to circle that word authority, 
And if you didn't bring your Bible, but you sat next to someone who did, circle it for them. It is allowed today. So Jesus is teaching, and they're amazed because he's teaching with authority. Not as the religious people of the time, not as the teachers of the law. Verse 23, just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth, what do you want with us? Ah, we know who you are, Jesus, son of David. I told you I read the Bible differently, see? Because my hesitation is that we come in and we read about a man who's demon-possessed and be like, okay, yeah, he was in church. Can you imagine if someone demon-possessed stood up right now and starts screaming, ah, Jesus! I want us to go into the pages of scripture. I want us to dive into it line by line. I want us to envision us being in the synagogue and hearing this. What did Jesus respond with? Look at verse 25. Shut up. Shut up. Jesus said sternly. He didn't yell. He didn't cry out. He didn't cuss. He said, shut up. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out with a shriek. Ah! Imagine that. What would you do? How would you feel? What did you hear? Verse 27, the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him being Jesus spread quickly all over the whole region of Galilee. See, when you witness or participate in the all-powerful nature of the one true God, you begin to witness a disruption in perceived order. And those who witness it are also those who participate in it. If you were with us at the Hurt Conference on Friday or on Saturday, there was a disruption of perceived order. That doesn't come because you could plan it and PCO or schedule it or say, at this moment, the Spirit of God's gonna drop. No, 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 no. It's because we were walking with a prayerful spirit. There were many of us who fasted before we were here and we believe that we operate with power and authority from Jesus. I love, I love the book of Mark. So you are going through the one-year Bible, and if you haven't, I'm going to encourage you, jump in for the New Testament, all right? Old Testament's awesome, Leviticus, Minor Prophets, hold it down, Nahum, all right. But when you get to the New Testament, it gets even better, because the New Testament is the fulfillment of the law, and it's in the love letters and the words of our Savior, Jesus. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books in the New Testament are called the Gospels. Well, Mark, and they all give different perspectives. Well, I love Brother Mark. Brother Mark writes the shortest of the Gospels because he's writing in bullet points. Basically, God is awesome. Follow him. Um, Mark is kind of like a biblical meathead. Here's the details. There's no, uh, here's not the details. Here's just the pool points. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is, and things are going to explode. Things are going to happen immediately, and suddenly it's going to be awesome. He's basically like a DC Marvel movie, right? Where everything happens so fast and you're turning your head and you're surprised like, oh, didn't see that coming. Well, why did Mark write in this way? Well, theologians know that Mark was writing to a, a, a Roman audience. Now, keep in mind, Rome was the powerhouse during this time. Rome had military power. Romans were obsessed with two things, power and authority. So by Mark laying this out, he is putting Jesus in a position of authority and power. In fact, as you go through this book, the first half of the, half of the book of Mark highlights the authority of Jesus. And then the second part of the book really focuses on the power of Jesus. In chapter one, uh, in the, in the chapter one alone, you'll see these words immediately, suddenly, at once, and without delay, used five times in this one chapter. In the entire book of Mark, the word immediately, speaking about the immediacy and the power of Jesus, that one word is used 40 times. Jesus had a, a power and authority to live out his calling. He did not just preach it. No, 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 no. He demonstrated it. That's what I want for the Capital C Church. That's what I want for our church, the Father's House, Orange County. That's what I want for XR Church. That's what I want for Crossroads Church, that we are not just a church that preaches and teaches. We are a church that wants to demonstrate the life and times of Jesus Christ through our own lives. Do not be intimidated. I want you to know today without a shadow of a doubt that the same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave is alive in you and that he has dubbed you. He has knighted you today that you are the woman for the job. You are the man for the job because when you know who Jesus is, 
It changes who you are. And I love that this is exactly what Mark is teaching us. When you go through Mark, you'll see a smattering of characters that Jesus uses. But in chapter 1 alone, we see this crazy man called John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. Why is that? Because he was heralding and proclaiming like a crazy man, wearing uh, animal skin and, and eating wild locusts, that's crickets, dipped in honey, long hair before the hippie or hipster thing was cool. I mean, they thought he was crazy. Chapter 1, that's John. What about Peter and Andrew and James? These are the first disciples. Hey, they were day laborers. They were blue-collar bro roughneck brothers. They would be the ones that were picking the grapes in the vineyards nearby. What about the possessed man that we just read about? He would be labeled dangerous, an outsider. What about the leper? There's a leper that we don't have time to read, but in verse 40, he was a society outcast, the unwanted. But when, in, when they encounter the power and the authority of Jesus, his love and grace, his mercy, his kindness, his healing power, his saving grace, they were changed. Dare I say they were marked. Because Peter, a roughneck brother with a bad seaside accent, tan skin and tattered clothes because he was out on the sea. See, you don't picture Peter like that. But Peter, I don't know if you know this. Let's do the inventory. Tan skin, bad clothes, seaside accent. He's basically from Jersey Shore. He's like, yeah, buddy, let's go, Jesus. I'm going to be cutting off ears. That man, that hot mess express, gave one of the greatest theological dissertations in the book of Acts, and 3,000 people came to know Jesus. He used a fisherman. John the Baptist was the greatest heralder that we see of Messiah, Mashiach, the one to come. We see Peter's mom, who is almost on her deathbed in, in Mark chapter 1. She almost dies, encounters Jesus. She becomes the chef de cuisine for Jesus and the disciples. She cooks him food. The possessed man walks into mental sanity and healness. Anxiety, depression, oppression is gone. And the leper was cleansed in the name of Jesus and found healing. When you know who Jesus is, when you encounter him, when there's that divine disruption, your life cannot help but be changed. Now, we all love the idea of us being marked for purpose, marked for potential. I want to be used. But see... It requires action on our part. Yeah. Following Jesus means we leave our comfort zone. We have to leave our comfort zone to step into our calling. In other words, he is calling you into your calling and out of comfort. He is calling you into your calling and out of your comfort. The primary role of Jesus is not to comfort. And you might have come in here today and you're like, I just need comfort. The good news is, it is the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is actually referred to as our comfort. If you need comfort today, may the Spirit of God give you comfort. But Jesus did not come to bring comfort. Jesus came to confront. He came to be a disruptor, to find your calling. You're going to have to forsake comfort. To find your divine calling, you have to experience discomfort. So let's break this down. Jump back with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 21. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Now, here in American English and how we usually pronounce this city, we say Capernaum. But for those that were at the Women's Conference, you know I am 1% Jew. I'm Jew-ish. You're welcome. So I'm going to teach you Gentiles about my heritage. See, we say Capernaum, but that's not how it's pronounced. Say this with me. Say Kefir. Nechum. No, you didn't do You have to be Hebrew. Say Kefir. Nechum. Oh, good job. Baptized by your spit today. This is awesome. <laughs> Kefir means village. Nechum means comfort. Jesus goes into the village of comfort to disrupt. Jesus rolls into the synagogue. It's like the church. Imagine Jesus rolling up in here today, and he began to teach. There's power in teaching the word of God. Look at verse 22. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the jokers that acted all spiritual and ate manna for breakfast and levitated on holiness. They spent four hours in their devotions to the King James Version of the Bible. They pray in tongues like those people, right? The very religious people. Look at, they were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not the teachers of the law. So Jesus is this guest teacher that's rolling into town, tearing it up. And these people are shook. 
Old Testament version would be they are shooketh, okay? They are saying, amen, hallelujah, come on, praise God. They were, they were feeling it. They heard these words, same words that had been spoken by the mouths of other religious people, but the way that Jesus spoke them, there was power and authority. Jesus was dripping with anointing. He was dripping with authority. They were about the explanation, but they were leery of the demonstration. And that's where people trip up. We're okay talking about the power and authority of God. Uh, but when talking leads to action, sometimes we get freaked out. Look at verse 23. Just then, a man in their synagogue who had been possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? There's multiple spirits tormenting this man. Scripture says that there's impure spirit, but yet we see that, that there is an us here. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I want to pause on the topic of demon possession. Uh, this topic deserves an entire series. It's also a hard topic, so I leave that to Pastor Derek. Praise God. Okay, great. <laughs> but I have to acknowledge it because I don't want us to get sidetracked by demon possession. I want us instead to focus on the power of Jesus to heal this man. See, they were down for proclamation. They were down for explanation, but they tripped up at the demonstration. They said, who is this man with power to cast out demons? The greatest proclamation of the gospel isn't explanation, it's demonstration. As someone who is marked, talking to someone who is marked, let me tell you something very clearly. You can know all the Bible verses. You could have gone to Sunday school and vacation Bible school. You might have even gone to seminary. You might know Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. You might know uh, how to recite all the books of the 66 books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But if you do not exemplify, if you do not demonstrate the good news that resides within you, what does it matter? I don't care if you could parse out scripture and exegete the Bible. Are you a jerk? That, guess what? That stuff matters. And if you want to abdicate and say, no, that's not for me. That's for Pastor Derek because he's the pastor. Pastor Jessica, oh, she leads beautifully. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. she's so gentle. She's so kind. She exhibits the gift, the fruits of the spirit. But me, no, no, that's not for me. Let me tell you something. You are marked. Stop. I'm, oh, oh, I was, I, I, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this very lovingly. Stop acting like you are not marked and it's giving you license to be horrible. You are marked. I see far too many Christians being absolute caustic and vile and mean or way on the other side of the spectrum, walking their head down low like a spiritual Eeyore. I just am never going to win. My life's horrible. I come from a sad family. I'm always just going to be sad. Pick your head up, child of God. The same spirit that resurrected Jesus is alive in you. Walk with that power. Walk with that authority and start claiming the territory the enemy has stolen from you. You are a marked child of God. Start acting like the child of the Most High King. And if you're sitting here thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. In Scripture, we see pastors and preachers and evangelists and apostles and prophets. How could that be me? By the life that you live. St. Augustine said, preach the gospel. When necessary, use words. Your life is a living epistle that people read on the daily. Let's make this practical. At the Her Conference, a woman by the name of Angela bought one ticket for herself and bought a second ticket for someone else. That someone else was her 15-year-old niece. It's far from God working through things in her life that felt spiritually lost. And this 15-year-old in this room, five, 600 women, put language to articulate what she felt in feeling really lost in this season that gave language and permission for women to step into that as well. Angela's obedience impacted her niece's life, and her niece's words and life impacted our life. This is what happens when we obey what God has called us to do. You don't have to know all the scripture, bring them to church. You don't have to have the gift of healing to pray for somebody in faith and believe that God can heal them. Guess what? You can demonstrate love and kindness and mercy and joy just like Jesus. You don't have to know the Old and New Testament. You have to know Jesus because when you know who Jesus is, it changes who you are. It's not just about proclamation. I'm a Christian. I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't do anything fun. I've had a spiritual lobotomy. I have no personality at all. No. 
It's not just proclamation, honey. It is demonstration. I'm walking in the power and authority of God. Look at verse 24. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus says sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out with a shriek. Ah! Imagine that happening right here. And let's pause on a detail that I don't want us to miss. The demon-possessed man sat in church and nobody noticed. I, I read this passage and I ask questions like, how long did that man attend church? How long did anyone see this man and yet not know that he was oppressed, oppressed, and depressed? Better yet, how many of us show up with spirits here that nobody is aware of? Please know that Jesus doesn't respond with strenuous activity. He doesn't flip over tables or cuss them out or say, get out of him. No, no, no. You have power and authority. Jesus just said, be quiet. Get out of him. Now, scripture doesn't include any details because I believe Jesus acted normal and chill, mad swag, low key. Shut up, get out. Now, why do I say this? Because other parts of scripture do indicate Jesus' emotions. When he was angry with the religious people, he flipped over tables in the temple. When he was sad, when his BFF Lazarus died, he cried. When the Pharisees were acting like Judgy McJudgerson, he rebuked them. So we know that Jesus could, but here he just says a phrase. Some of your translations might say Jesus silenced him, Jesus rebuked him, Jesus shut him up. See, Jesus didn't need to prove his power. He's authority and his power does not need to be proven because that's what he walks in. So Jesus, no volume was needed to silence the enemy. You just walk in your authority. Now, I've seen this lived out because I was raised, you know, my mom and my dad, but my mom is a Puerto Rican mom. If you know anything about Latin moms, they look sweet. Okay, mommy, come here. Let me tell you something, okay? Listen, my mom is a church woman. She's a pastor's wife. She's raised and homeschooled five children. She's the wife of a USMC Marine. Who raw, simplify, okay? Like, the woman is anointed and called and gracious and sweet and kind, but she is sweet until she's sour. You cross my mama, she will set it straight. And I remember being church kids running amok and running a fool, and my mom would, would come in with a big smile on her face and kind eyes and grit through her teeth. You better stop, because I will beat you into next week. Week, all right, my eyes would be the size of saucers. My eyebrows would like singe off because mama was mad. See, she didn't have to make a big scene because she knew she had power and authority. I want to let you know that you have that same power and authority in Jesus' name. I want you to repeat after me. Can you say, get out? Get out. I want you to say it with the equal amount of ferocity, but more calm. Say, get out. get out. I want you to whisper this. Say, all you need to do is say, get out. John, 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I want us to get very comfortable with speaking to things in this world with power and authority. Why is that? Because I'm holding on to the promise that Jesus gave us in John 14, 12. He said, the things that I have done, you will do these and greater. If Jesus is casting out impure spirits, you better believe I want the same thing. So I'm going home, I'm walking into my home and I'm saying, get out enemy, you have no room here. I'm walking into my church and I say, get out enemy, there's freedom that's going to be here. I came into this church, walked the pews, walked the living, walked the foyer and said, get out. You have no room here, enemy. There are impure spirits and demons that are wanting to distract you, to destroy you, to disrupt you. And I'm sitting here very calm, cool and collected, not even schwitzing. I'm saying, get out. And this isn't something that I'm just proffering and proselytizing to you today. No, this is something that I do in my home church. I get to church every Sunday morning at 6.30 with my heels and fake eyelashes, and I anoint every single chair and pray over it because I know there is power in authority in my words. And whatever the enemy wants to come to steal, kill, and destroy, I remind him that though he may come at me one way, he will flee in seven. There is a destiny for you, and it ain't here. It's hell. Go back to hell. I'm not weeping. I'm not wailing. I'm simply saying with a smile on my face, gritting through my teeth like my Puerto Rican mama, get out. People are going to find freedom in here today. Get out. People are going to experience joy today. Get out. So devil, get out. You have no room in my marriage. You have no room in the lives of my kids. You have no room in my finances. You have no room in my singleness. See, that's my script, but what's yours? You need to write your script. What do you need to tell the devil to get out of? Shut up. Verse 23. 
There's a lot. I heard somebody say, that's a lot. Amen, sister. It is. <laughs> Verse 23, a man in the synagogue who was possessed with the impure spirit cried out. See, this man showed up thinking it was just another Sabbath, just another Sunday. But I have to ask the question, how long had this impure spirit plagued him? How long did this man go getting more and more comfortable with the oppression that had been on him that he had gotten used to being oppressed by the spirit? But then Jesus shows up. The Son of God shows up. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords shows up. The Lamb of the living God who is a propitiation for our sins, who stood as a substitute for our sins, who went to the cross for our sins, into the grave and resurrected to the power and glory of God. Yeah, Jesus shows up and demons travel. Now, this morning, I want to declare the power that there is in the name of Jesus. And I don't want to freak nobody out. But how many of y'all came in with some spirits? How many of y'all came in with some demons? Now, don't freak out and get tied booty like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen today? Nothing's going to happen. We're just doing an honest assessment of where we're at. If we make this passage about demons, we miss the demonstration of Jesus' power and authority. See, in the ancient world, everything was a demon. You had a cough, it's a demon. You had a sneeze, it's a demon. You had a seizure, it's a demon. But I want to make this very personal. I'm not talking about real demons though I do believe demons exist, I'm talking about some of those spirits that we walk around with that we don't even recognize anymore. What did you come in here with that you have grown anesthetized to the oppression that hangs on your neck like a yoke? That spirit of bitterness, I'm angry I didn't get what I deserve. That spirit of jealousy, I can't believe God's using them. Oh, they were in the club on Friday. How do you know that? Were you at the club too? That spirit of comparison, if I just had what they had, I would. That spirit of judgment that hangs on us. Oh, they're not as good as a Christian am I, as I am. That spirit of division. You love to gossip. You love to complain. There's a spirit of contention. What about the spirit of hatred? Those black people, those white people, those brown people, those Asian people. See, the enemy wants us to get comfortable with our daily oppression that we don't even see it anymore. You're in Kefir Nechem, the village of comfort with your demons. And these these impure spirits, these unclean spirits are hanging and vexing around your neck like a heavy yoke. They've been tormenting your mind. They've been plaguing your soul. And you actually brought it to church. Let me tell you something. It is high time we clean out Kefir Nechem. God is calling you into your calling and out of your comfort. Your comfort with bitterness. Your comfort with jealousy. Your comfort with comparison. Your comfort with hatred. Your comfort with bigotry. And I'm whispering over you the same words that Jesus said. Get out. Be quiet. Look at verse 24. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You know what trips me out about this passage? The demons knew the power and authority of Jesus, but the church folk didn't. Mm, mm, mm. Demons were like, oh, snap. He's come to get rid of us. Messiah is messing with us, all right? See, demons tremble because they know that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Whatever you walked in here with today, church, whatever thing that is holding you back because of comfort, I want us to break free. Because John the Baptist became a herald for the king of kings and stanky fishermen became those to turn the world right side up. And the possessed man found healing and sanity and the leper was cleansed as an evangelist. When you meet Jesus, it changes who you are. When I went to prison and met Lasharia, I never thought I would see Lasharia ever again. Two years ago, I was speaking at a conference, a women's conference, 5,000 women in Dallas, Texas. I was uh, walking off the stage from preaching, and there was a long corridor, a very long corridor, I, I would say half the length of a football field. And I see a person wearing a lime green volunteer shirt, and they shout, Pastor Bianca! And I turn and I look down the corridor and I hear, it's just me and Jesus, tick it, tick it. It's just me and Jesus. I turn around. I said, LaSharia, 
She said, every ticket for this conference was sold out, but I know I had to connect with you. And of all the places that they would be stationed me to serve, it was right here. And I want to remind you, it's just me and Jesus. This woman was marked with calling, with purpose and destiny. And if an incarcerated woman had a revelation of who Jesus was that so impacted our life, church, what's our excuse? I want us to know that we are marked, but you got to shake off the comfort and you got to clean out your heart with the demons and the impure spirits that are there. And my fear is you're going to hear this and say, well, just like Peter, I'll always be a blue collar, uneducated guy. Or maybe you feel like John the Baptist, like ah, everyone just thinks I'm crazy. Like I'm just, no one's ever going to listen to me. Or maybe you feel like the leper where you feel like you're on the outside. Or maybe you feel like Lasharia, because of your past, you can't be used. I don't want us to hold on to our insecurity. I don't want us to hope on, hold on to any lies of the enemy. I don't want us to get stuck in our label or our dysfunction or even our comfort. Are you in the village of Capernaum? Jesus wants to set you free. I don't want the impure spirits that have been hanging on you to suck any more life out of you. Those voices that you hear say things about you that are completely untrue, I want you to say, get out. You have no room in my marriage. You have no room in the life, the minds of my kids. You have no room in my singleness. You have no room here. We have power in the name of Jesus to know that we are marked, we are called, we are fashioned with passion, purpose, and potential, and we have authority in the name of Jesus.